we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, one of the things we're obviously going to be praying about is the Ukraine and our, especially our brothers and sisters that are there. If you didn't know this, the, it's not the Ukraine. Ukraine uh, is the, the greatest missionary sending country of Europe. Uh, they are, especially what we were 15, 60 years ago, they send more missionaries than any other country in, in the Europe. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. So there's lots of brothers and sisters there, lots of Christians that are there, and we want to pray for them. Uh, we will also want to pray for our deacon election, and that's kind of a big deal for our church family, and that's happening today, uh, and that we would all make wise decisions. Also, when you think about like this, the third verse of the song that we sang a moment ago, O joy that seekest me through pain, I can't close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel that the promise is not vain, that mourn shall tearless be. The statement of looking into a dark night where you're not entirely sure how this night's going to end, but trusting that the Lord is there in the morning. You and I have a hard time relating to that sometimes, but our brothers and sisters in Ukraine do not. Uh, so we want to lift them up in prayer uh, and the Lord's love, which is what we'll talk about this morning, to be present for them as it is for us. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to worship. It's good to be here. It's good to be with family. Uh, it's good, and I know it's good for me, to be able to praise you and talk about the things that you have done for me, to talk about and sing about your faithfulness that we will in just a moment. And Father, I want to thank you for that opportunity and for being so good and faithful. We ask your blessings on what we're doing here today, on our deacon election, that you would be honored in that, that we would be prayerful and obedient as we choose those who will serve, uh, that will serve us for the next three years. And Father, the thing that's pressing on all of our hearts and minds is Ukraine and the heartache that is there and the trouble that is there, especially our brothers and sisters that are there. And we ask for your intervention. We ask for your presence there that comes in, in strength and in fortitude and a hope of a morning and a day that is coming. And Father, we ask for your physical intervention. We ask for protection. And so, Father, would you be there would you be there, especially with our brothers and sisters, as they are able to not only fight for their freedom and their lives, but also fight for what it means to be a follower of Christ and to show that faith and that courage and that strength to the people around them, to the world that is watching. We ask your blessings on our president, that you would give him wisdom and guidance as he makes decisions of how our country will be a part, you know, what support we will or will not give. And, and Father, we just trust that to you. We ask that you would give him wisdom and courage to make decisions that are, that are wise. Father, give us the chance to love them. Give us the chance to, to help them. That you keep them on our mind, not just out of interest, not just out of curiosity, but out of love that draws us to prayer. And bless us here today. Be with us as we study the book of Ephesians, God, that your love would be made known to us in very real and powerful ways when you speak to our hearts in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen to that. Get your Bible. We're going to be in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we are working through this the book of Ephesians, thinking about how we are welcomed and invited into the family of God. And uh, we come to this in interesting passage. It, it's almost like a transition. It, well, it is a transition passage. Let's just call it that because next week we'll be uh, into chapter 4 and things start getting way more ethical. And we talk about like life within the church. and this, uh, We'll actually use the phrase new family, new rules. We'll talk about that a lot over the next couple of weeks. Um, so today's moving us into that section. And Paul talks about, well, Paul asks a prayer. He offers a prayer for the church, for the church in Ephesus. And we then think that that continues and is applied to us. And it's the second time he's done that in this book. If you were to look in Ephesians chapter 1, like 18, 19, 20 in there, he also prays for the, uh, the church in Ephesus. And we'll make some comparisons in that today. But to, for here, we're going to look at this prayer. And it, it's, a, it's a long prayer. It's five or six verses where Paul prays for the church, for Ephesus and for you and me, I want you to look at it before we dive into it. Verse 14 of chapter 3. For this reason, and we talk about for this reason, he goes back to verse 13. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings, which are from your, for your glory. So remind me, like, the fact that Paul is suffering and he doesn't want us to be discouraged by that, he then says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want you to think about there. We're going to start there because that's actually the part that jumps out to us. It's like, all right, I like the way this sounds. And that verse 20. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power. Like this, this God who is able to do everything that we ask him to do and then even more. Like, and I kind of love that idea. Like I can do more than you want, right? Like I can do, you ask for the world and then I can give you the world and the moon. Like I love that idea that that's what, what God is. That Paul says that God is able to do more than we can even imagine to ask. And some of us can imagine to ask a whole lot of that. And he does it according to his power that has been placed in us. Now, this is where we start our throwback to uh, chapter 1. All right. So if you were to go back to my, I'm going to look at it. It's chapters 1, uh, like verse 19, it's part of his prayer. And he says, and it, his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power that has been placed inside of us who believe, is what he says, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You remember that about three weeks ago or so that we talked about the, the very power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, to defeat death and provide salvation to everyone lives in me. And if you're a follower of Christ, it lives in you. Now, for many of us, that may be an untapped power because we're not pursuing that relationship with the Lord. We're not asking him to use us to bring about change in the world. And that's between you and Jesus, right? We worked through that. That's what we talked about several weeks ago. But the point is that that, that power that resides in us, now Paul comes back to it again in chapter 3, that God is able to do what we can imagine to ask, and even more than that, because he has the power to imagine things that you and I don't have the power to imagine. He can answer the prayers and the requests that we have through the same power that resides in us thanks to the presence of the Holy Spirit. This little verse, it's actually one of these great comfort verses, right? Like this is the kind you won't crochet over the bathroom wall or something so that you see it every now and then and that God can do so much more than even I can ask. That brings comfort to me knowing that I am not just in the service of, but am the son and the child of an all-powerful God brings comfort. But here's what's interesting about this. And, and, and this, is the, uh, this is what fascinates me about this passage, is to think like Paul offers this prayer to a God who is all-powerful, right? So this God who can do everything that I can ask and even more, Paul's going to ask him to do some things for the church. And you think about it, of all the things that Paul could ask for the church, and there's lots of things, especially for the church in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a, a struggled church. Their, their faith is strong, but the world around them is, is difficult. There's persecution that is there. There's massive persecution that is coming. Think about what Paul could be praying on behalf of that church for protection, a hedge of protection around them. We use that phrase a lot. Or, or missional success. Or God, could you grow their numbers? Or God, could you make sure that they don't have any inner strife? Or whatever the things. Like give them success and victory and power. Give them all these things. Paul could have asked for all that. And God says, I can do that and even more. But of all the things that Paul could have asked on behalf of the church in Ephesus, and that he asked then, I think, on behalf of the church at Grace, notice what he does ask. I want you to look in verse 16 and see what he says. I pray that out of his glorious... Now, you've got to just work through this with me, all right? There's so many prepositional phrases here. This is days worth of work for me, like just pulling it all out and putting it together. So stick with me. I pray that out of his glorious riches, so put that aside, here we go. I pray that he may strengthen you with power through his inner spirit, I mean through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Of all the things that Paul could have prayed for us, 
He prays for strength in our inner beings. All right. Now think about what he says. Like you go back to chapter 1, verses 18, 19, that first prayer. Paul prays that we would know God's big power, this resurrection power, that we would be aware of it and be like, oh, wow, that's cool. And that lives in me. We want to know and see the big picture. And now two chapters later, he, he fine-tunes that a little bit. His prayer is a bit more focused that we would not only know about this power, but that we would be strengthened by it in our inner being, that we would have it and know it and know that it's there and be encouraged by the fact that, that, that it's, it's here, wherever here is. This is one of those like existential, like philosophical questions that I'll be honest, I struggle with. My mind, I, I tend to work in black and white, right? Like abstract philosophy is difficult for me. So I think about what in the world is an inner being? You would think I would know. I have a doctorate in something, right? Like I should have figured this out. <laughs> Truth is, I have no idea. What is an inner being? It's going to have something to do like, like with our, well, we use the word heart, but our, our soul, our core of, of who we are, what it means to, to be David, all right? I think that like not only am I human, but then I'm a unique human, right? That whatever that is, is that, that inner being, your identity and who you are as a person at the very core of, of what you are and who you are, removing all the facades that we put up, all the pl- praise, things that we do to protect ourselves or to make ourselves even look better than we actually are. You strip all that down and you get down to your your inner being. And Paul prays for us to be strengthened with power there. Wherever that is, whatever that is that is the very core of what it means to be you, of what it means to be me, Paul says, I I pray that you would be strengthened in that most intimate of places. In that place that that actually controls and dictates all other places. And notice what he does. He then equates that with Christ dwelling with us. I want you to look at this again. Again, prepositional phrases. Walk through with this with me. I pray, verse 16, that out of his glorious riches he may, listen, strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And then we've got this phrase in verse 17, so that... I would, if I, well, I'm not going to tell you to do this because then you'll like yell at me. But if I were you, I would take a little pencil and mark through the so that. Because it doesn't exist in the Greek. That's a translation thing that honestly confuses us in this verse. All right. So really what it says is that that so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Don't be confused by the so that because the, the, the word, the, the verb that comes after that may dwell is, is an infinitive. All right, it's an aorist infinitive, and I don't even remember what all that means, but I know what infinitive means, right? A sense of perpetuity, a, per- a sense of it continues to happen, it's going to keep going. It's that Christ dwells, that Christ dwelling. It's not a so that Christ may dwell, it's Christ is dwelling, so these things are connected. So read that the way it should be, I think, read. Is, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith. It's not one leading to the other, which actually I like. I mean, that preaches, right? One leads to the other, but that's not what it says. That we would be strengthened in our inner being, Christ being there. Christ on the inside spilling out and affecting what's on the outside. What Paul prays is for strength and for the power of God that comes from Christ that dwells in our heart being at the seat of you, of your soul, of your conscience, of your identity, of whatever this is that then controls and dictates everything else for you, that we would know the power of Christ dwelling there. Now, I'm just hoping, I'm hoping that you are as nerdy as I am, and you're already thinking about a Disney movie. Anybody thinking about a Disney movie called Inside Out? Came out, what, four or five years, actually, one of the Pixar Disney movies, and it's cute. You've got, you know, the five little, I don't know what even to call them, basically your soul that exists in five persons that live inside this little girl, and they're controlling her. If you remember, the, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. If not, it's basically you've got these little, whatever they are, and they sit at a control board that's somewhere in the soul of this little girl, and they push buttons that help her act a certain way and help her not act a certain way, and usually joy is in charge, and that's why children are so happy, and it's wonderful, but every now and then joy gets confused or goes to the bathroom or whatever she does, and anger takes over, and that's where we learn, like, teenagers, they, they anger tends to drive a teenager's life and the movie's like that there's this battle that's happening inside between all these emotions at the console controlling your life now that said what paul is saying is put christ in that console seat 
knowing that Christ doesn't make mistakes, doesn't take breaks, which is the whole point of the movie. And he's the one pushing the buttons. He is at the control seat of your life, at, at your inner being, at your soul, at whatever that inside out thing is, that Christ sits there. And that's powerful. Knowing that every thought and every action that comes out of me can and should be controlled by Christ and emanate from the power of Christ that dwells inside us. So this idea that Jesus is at that board exercising authority over our lives, and, and here's the beauty of it, in transforming us. Because this is one of the things the movie kind of misses, is that the fact that we are all kind of messed up by nature, aren't we? The idea in that movie is that joy is usually in the driver's seat is actually backwards because usually we're not. Like we're, we're messed up. We're fallen. That's the theology that we know is that we are broken people. Fallen and rebellious by nature. But Christ comes into my life, into my heart, into my whatever inner being is. And not only can start taking control and give me power and a sense of mission and purpose and, and meaning, but, but he starts to transform me. He starts to change who I am, not out here, but in here. He changes who my, my core is. And here's what's beautiful about that is think about the transformation. That, that's the way transformation happens is it happens from the inside out. Like that, you don't transform on the out, you transform on the inside and let that play its way out, which is why we, like as a church, for instance, we concern ourselves with what we would call heart transformation. We concern ourselves with the soul of a person, with the core, the inner being of a person, and to put Christ into that place, knowing that if Christ is in the inner being, the rest of it's going to kind of work itself out. Our primary goal, you think about how we work this like with our children or grandchildren, or how we would, I think, work with this with any ministry work. Our primary goal is what? Heart transformation. Salvation. To help them get Christ into their inner being and to transform them in the way that Christ has transformed us. And we oftentimes, and this is the thing we have to like resist as a church, is we have to resist this urge to get wrapped up in the outside parts. I don't know about you, but that's what youth group felt like for me growing up. Right? It was like, all right, don't do this, do do this. It was about how do you control your hands and your eyes and your toes and your tongue. And if you can control all of that, then everything's going to work out. And you, you probably do look a little more Christian. But are you? The way in which to control my tongue is to change my heart. Because, right, the tongue is a dipstick for the soul. The same thing for my eyes and my mouth and everything else that can get me in trouble is those are just manifestations of either the darkness or the light that is present within me. And we often get so wrapped up in worrying about how a person's behaving or how a person talks. And we look at a non-Christian and we're like, God, they're so pagan. They act so ugly. Well, of course they are. They're pagan on the inside. And I'm not going to worry about how they talk and how they act and how they walk. What I'm going to worry about is the transformation of the heart that's on the inside and let Jesus do the rest because I can't. And I think this gives us, like, there's a, a little ethic here for us. We just bloop it right out of this passage, is that Christ lives within us. And Paul's praying for this power of transformation that's happened in all of us. And that's then what we pray for and ask for one another and for those around us, is that they would have Christ within them to transform them, and that we learn to then be patient with people, knowing that they are in the process of being transformed. Because even the best of us are all being transformed from the inside out. None of us are there yet, are we? There are parts of my life that are still dark. There are parts of my life that I still try to control, and there's a fight within my inner being. And Paul wants me to know the power of Christ that is there. And that power is better than my own power. It's better for me. It's better for you. It's better for everything. And to, to grab hold of that, to trust it, and to know it. So Paul, think about what he, and what he, he says here is, I pray that you may be strengthened with power in your inner being. Christ dwelling within us. So he prays for this inner strength that only comes from our relationship with Jesus. But that's not all he prays for. He doesn't just pray for our inner strength. He prays for you to be strong enough. All right. So I want you to keep going in what he says. So you go to, to, to keep going in verse 17. Christ dwelling in your heart through faith and I pray. So he continues that and I pray that you 
being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Again, so many prepositional phrases, but let's simplify it. Paul prays that we would be have the strength, this inner strength in our inner being to be able to grasp the love that Christ has for us. And I have to think then, like, like Paul's making an assumption about his church people here in Ephesus that they don't. Like, I think he's making an assumption that they don't adequately appreciate Christ's love for them. Because if they did, like, he may not have to remind them of this. And then I step back and think, well, gosh, do I? have an adequate appreciation of the love that Christ has for us, which then, of course, makes me ask the question for you. Do you have an appreciation, an adequate appreciation of the love that Christ has for us? And the answer is probably going to be no. I don't know that we do because we probably don't dwell on it enough. And you want to just ask yourself this question. Like, do you ever wrestle with the depth of the love of Christ? As Paul says, you know, how deep and how wide and how long and how like, he uses all these prepositional phrases to help us think that it's, it's so much bigger than us. And I wonder if you ever dwell on that. Are you ever blown away by the fact that Christ loves you? Or even better, that Christ still loves you after you've done whatever fill in the blank. That's where it usually hits me, when I act like an idiot, when I'm selfish, when I do something that is so clearly against the teachings of this scripture, and God's like, yeah, you're an idiot, <laughs> but I love you still. And if we would stop and dwell in that moment, I, I, not only did I think it would correct and help us with our behavior, because that's transformation, but it would absolutely blow our mind. How does Christ love me that much? How does he still love me after all of my mistakes and after all of my rebellions and all the ways that I have acted in a way that would be embarrassing to him if he were standing right next to me? And he's like, I've been here the whole time and I still love you. Holy cow. Paul, what, what he's pushing us here, and I think what he's praying for us is that we could try to wrap our minds around the fact that Christ loves us that much. That that love is there in such a, a large and all-encompassing and an infinity type of thing. And I think we, we have to think about this more because it's all about the love of Christ. My, my position in this family, the fact that I have been elected and included into the family of God is all because, what? Christ loved me. As a matter of fact, he lays that out for us if you didn't pay attention to it. He says in the end of verse 17, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power then to grasp how much Christ loves you. But you notice, being rooted and established in love. Not in our love, but in Christ's love for us. That that's why we are in the family. The whole reason we are in the family is because Christ loves us and chooses to include us. That we are rooted in his love. And out of that rooting can we begin to try to grasp how vast, how wide and deep and beautiful is the love of Christ for his family. Can you wrap your mind around that? The idea that you can't outrun the love of Christ. That you can't break the love of Christ. That there is no heinous act that you can commit that Christ like, yeah, I'm done. No. Because his love for us, it, it surpasses knowledge. There's, there's always more for us to understand. That's why we keep coming to church, right? Like we, there's always more to understand and to, to wrap our mind around the knowledge of the, the, the love that Christ has for us because that love is, is infinite and it's expressed to us through his death. Is expressed the death of Christ in the way that Paul lays it out. His death is the way that he expresses to us the infiniteness of his love. Because here's the thing I dwell on this every now and then. Like, I just stop and think the fact that Christ didn't have to do this, did he? He didn't have to die. And I'm fascinated because, of course, we, we, we set up Jesus as our hero. And he is our hero. He, he's a hero. But the beauty about a, a, a human hero is a human hero is going to die anyway, Right? Like any hero you want to look at, they're going to die anyway. But if they do it as a hero, they just basically sped up the process and did it in a glorious fashion. Jesus didn't have to die in the beginning. He wasn't going to just naturally. He didn't have to do any of that. He chose to. He chose to put himself into a position that he didn't have to go into anyway. That's a whole other level of like hero moment for us. And that he chose us. 
He chose to put himself into this world and through the problem and the hurt and the pain of death that he did not have to experience. And he did it just for us as an expression of his infinite love for us. That's how much Jesus loves us. Paul prays not only that we would be strengthened, yeah, be strengthened knowing that Christ is in us, but but that we could begin to grasp, to try to understand how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Of all the things that Paul could pray for the church, he prays that we would have strength enough to grasp the love of Jesus. Of all the things he could have prayed for us, that's what he puts forward. But there's one last thing I want you to notice in what he does, and and that's what happens in verse 18. Go back to the end of 7. Let's just read the phrasing. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power may have power to grasp how wide and long and how deep the love of Christ is, but that prepositional phrase in verse 18, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Did you notice that little phrase when you read through it? That together we would grasp the love of Christ. That together we would grasp the power of what it means to have Christ within us. And I honestly think this takes on a whole other realm of, the, uh, of meaning for us when we think about our brothers and sisters in Ukraine today. Like, I can't help but put that on the forefront of our mind. But the idea that, that we are supposed to be grasping how much Christ loves me, and you're supposed to be grasping how much Christ loves you, and we're supposed to be doing that together as a family that we would be about this journey together, that we would pray this together, that we would pray this same prayer for one another, that we would strive to show this type of Christ-like love to one another, that we would pursue Christ's love together, showing it to one another and finding it together. Here's what I think, and this we're gonna. I want to land the plane kind of weirdly today. Just just roll with me, and we'll we'll talk about it later. Is to think that Paul stops here in the middle of his letter, and all the great teachings that he's had, and he's going to turn, he's going to start telling us how we're supposed to live, and you know, controlling our hands and all that stuff. That's coming, and he stops, and he, and he says, "I'm I'm going to pray for you." I'm going to pray that you would be strengthened by the fact that Christ lives within you and to know that the very power of the resurrection dwells within you and that that would give you strength and courage and, 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 and would just come alive out of you to recognize how significant it is that that lives within you. And then also that you would have the strength to, to try to wrap your mind around, to grasp the fact that Christ loves you and the infiniteness of how much Christ loves you. Paul prays that for us. And my thought is, is that he's then pushing us to pray that for one another. That we would pray for each other to have an understanding of how significant it is that the power of resurrection dwells within us. That we would pray for one another to try to grasp how wide and significant Christ's love is for me and for one another. So what I want to do is close our time together in a corporate prayer time, really, that we would pray this prayer for one another, that you would be strengthened by the power of Christ within you, and that you would have the strength to then grasp the love of Christ that he has for you, and that we would pray that for each other. So here's what I want you to do. You don't have to actually do anything. I can see the look in your eyes, like he's going to make us get up. And like, lay, no, no, I'm not. I'm a little too Baptist for that, all right? We're cool. But I do want you to do this. Just look up and down your row. All right, Jackie, you'll just have to pick somebody. You're back there by yourself. All right, look at the people that you sit around. And here's what's cool about that's because let's be honest, we are Baptists. You sit by the same person every week. All right, (laughs) so y'all should know each other pretty well. You should care for one another pretty well. I want you just in the quiet of the next couple of minutes to pray this prayer for the people that sit next to you. Pick one, pick two or three. That would be appropriate. And pray what Paul has prayed. That that person that sits next to you would be strengthened by the power of Christ within them. And that they would then have the strength to grasp the love of Christ that he has for them. So we're going to go into a time of prayer. It's going to be quiet. You ain't got to get up and do anything. No jumping, please, and touching. 
Just pray that for the people around you. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pray that for you. And then I'll get up and kind of close this in a word of prayer. And then we'll go to our benediction. Okay. So let's pray for one another. Father, we pray for strength from one another. For our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, that they would know the power of the resurrection that dwells within them. That that would empower them to lives of strength and courage. And they would be able to grasp how much you love them. And Father, we pray for one another that our church family, that those that we worship next to and love would have the strength to understand the power that dwells within us. That the very power that brought Jesus back from the dead dwells with us and goes with us everywhere we go. And that you are empowering us to be world changers in that way. And Father, would you help us to grasp that power, to understand it, to live in it, to dwell in it. And Father, we pray that we also would be able to grasp the love that Christ has for us. That each one of us, that even today, like we would find a moment to sit and to dwell on the fact that Christ still loves me. Despite everything, Christ still loves me. And that you would help us have the strength to grasp how wide and how deep and how long and how high Jesus' love is for each of us. And how that is also true for our neighbors and for our relatives and for our friends. That you love them just as much. And that you would tap into that power that dwells within us to share that love with them. And to call them to you who love them. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen.